This is the first ever Science Uncovered live show. My name's Imogen and this is James and we're really excited about what we've got coming up for you on this evening's show. So Imogen, I have a little science joke for you. Oh, a science joke. I like a science joke. So what did the biologist wear to his first date? Mm, I don't know. What did the biologist wear to his first date? Designer jeans. <laughs> oh, that's awful. I'm sure you at home can do better than that. So throughout the show, we want you to tweet as Tweet us in your best science jokes and we'll read them out live on air. Tweet us at sci underscore uncovered and use the hashtag UniTVScience. Or you can comment on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash science uncovered. So without further ado, here's what's coming up on the rest of the show. Coming up on tonight's show, we have Battle of the Brains Round 1, featuring Life Science and Physics Society. Who will be the best at drawing? Ted Morrow interview, senior researcher talking about the controversial free parent baby technology, brain freeze experiment, what is brain freeze you might ask, a live experiment. Battle of the Brains round two will be our guest news round, featuring some of the latest stories in science. Ukulele Society, they will be playing us out for our ad break, playing Space Odyssey. Hello and welcome to Battle of the Brains, a very special quiz all about science. We're joined today by representatives from the Life Sciences Society and from QSOC, the Physics Society here at Sussex University. Now from QSOC we've got Louis and we've got Chris and from Life Sciences we've got Gabriella and we've got Oscar. Today they are going to be trying to find out who knows the most about science. So there will be three rounds in tonight's show and in this first round it will be like a giant game of Pictionary. So if Louis and Gabriella would like to step up to the board. Okay. Yep, I'll show you a word on the card and you will have to draw it for your teammate. Both Oscar and Chris you will have to guess the word and when you first know what it is just shout it out and you'll win the point. Okay, are you ready? I'll show you the first card. <laughs> yep, <laughs> and ready when you are? Go. DNA. Oh, brilliant. Well done, those sciences. <laughs> okay, rub it off quickly and I'll show you the next card. That was amazing. <laughs> it was really quick. <laughs> We're too advanced. <laughs> okay, go. Mountain, uh, light bulb, electricity. Yay, brilliant. One to Q sock. And rub off. <laughs> okay, get ready for the next one. Cell. Uh, nucleus. nucleus. Oh, <laughs> that was a tie. I'm going to have to give that to you both. That was definitely a tie. <laughs> okay, rub off. And for the fourth one, <laughs> hold on to the board. <laughs> fourth one. Okay, be inventive with it. Star. Uh, supernova. Test tube. Uh, thermometer. Black hole. Um, temperature. Heat. Energy. A Bunsen burner. Light. Um, <laughs> he's trying. He's uh, trying heat so hard. <laughs> energy. Um, um, radiation. Radiator. Precipitate, um, <laughs> um, explode, warm. What do you think um, it is? What are they? Oh god. Star, <laughs> star. It's a wintry theme. Uh, snow, snow, frost, lake. Uh, temperature, cold. Snow. Yay, that's what it says. Finally we got there. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that <laughs> you're so close. <laughs> okay, ready for the fifth one? Here we go. Uh, Test uh, flame. Uh, hey, yes. <laughs> and then for the last one, if you'll both rub off. <laughs> and here we go. <laughs> uh, tree, Christmas uh, Christmas tree. tree. Yay. Oh. That was physics. <laughs> okay, you've completed the picture round and you did really, really well. <laughs> I think that was actually a tough... I don't know who won that, so we'll come back to the scores later on in the show. <laughs> okay, you'll see us later for round two. But coming up next... Well, some people have a disorder, which means they can't control their limbs. So Hannah's going to tell us some more about that. In 
Stanley Kubrick's film, Dr. Strangelove, the main character has a disorder, which means that his left arm is constantly trying to control his right arm, which seems to have a will of its own. As bizarre as this fictional character sounds, this disorder actually occurs in real life, and it's because of this that alien hand syndrome is sometimes called Dr. Strangelove syndrome. Alien hand syndrome is a neurological disorder that affects movement. It's defined as having a limb that performs meaningful acts on its own. Rather, the sufferer feels that they have no conscious control over what that limb is doing. The limb does not do what the patient intends it to do, and this lack of control can lead to the limb taking objects and not letting go, hitting other people, and even hurting the patient themselves. Often, the sufferer of this disorder feels astonished and frustrated by their lack of control over their own limb. And it's because of this that they often feel that the limb is being controlled by some other being or force. They refer to the limb in the third person and they don't like to acknowledge that the limb belongs to them. This disorder has been well known to occur after surgery that has split the brain into two halves. Now, you may be wondering, why does surgery exist that splits the brain into two halves? Surely you need a well-connected brain. Well, you do, but in some cases it might be in the patient's best interest to split the brain into the two hemispheres. This type of surgery is called the split brain procedure and is most commonly used for sufferers of epilepsy so that the seizure can be isolated to one half of the brain, reducing its severity. Despite being a dangerous and risky procedure, it may be the best option for those suffering with epilepsy. It can also occur after stroke, infection, tumour and with degenerative brain disorders such as Alzheimer's disease. This disorder is very rare and since being identified in 1909, there have only been 40 to 50 recorded cases. Nevertheless, I hope you've enjoyed learning all about this strange and interesting disorder. So you might notice that I'm joined by someone different. Um, James has gone off to get ready for his experiment. He'll be back with that later on. Um, and I'm joined by Hannah. Hello. So um, Hannah, uh, what have people been tweeting in? I've got some jokes here. From The first one is from at DomJH. Thanks for your joke, Dom. Um, this one is, remember, never trust an atom because they make up everything. <laughs> uh, the next one oh. is, um, atom one says, I've lost an electron. And atom two says, are you positive? That's quite a good yeah, one. Yeah, that is a clever one. Yeah. And then from Jack <laughs> Sovereign, that actually works at UniTV, oh, right. um, it says, Schrodinger's cat walked into a bar and also it didn't. Is that, have I said I think, that right? Should yeah, I think so. Maybe that's yeah. physics or something. I'm not quite sure. I there. think I know what that's about, <laughs> but thank you, Jack. Um, yeah. Right, so yeah, next up, we're very lucky to have Ted Morrow with us. Thank you for joining us. Oh. Um, so Ted is a research scientist at the University of Sussex. Um, so Ted, you've had uh, a paper published recently that's been all over the news, very exciting for Sussex. Uh, can you briefly explain what it's about? It's about um, three parent babies, isn't it? Yeah, that's the, um, the, the kind of I informal way of describing this technique that they're hoping to develop to, to, develop to cure people or generate babies that without mitochondrial disease. So it's this mitochondrial replacement therapy. So um, the paper that we wrote was um, an idea to uh, was pointing out some of the potential problems that this therapy could generate as a as a byproduct of carrying out this three parent baby technique. Yeah. Cool. Mm. So if it could work, um, what kind of situations would it be really helpful in, and when would it be used? So um, some people have mutations in their mitochondrial genome. So we, we have genomes in our nucleus, but we also have this um, organelle in a cell which has a, it's a tiny genome of its own. And um, sometimes there are mutations that happen in that genome and they cause the mitochondria to um, stop working properly. And they're really important organelles for cellular respiration and other things. So um, people, the idea is that with these um, mutations, the, the mother would always pass on the problem to the children and the technique would um, aim to basically eliminate, wipe out that problem and replace it with a fully functioning mitochondria and mm. problem resolved. That's really interesting. Mm. So uh, that's the treatment that could be used, but your paper was about the problems that could arise with that treatment. So um, yeah, you mentioned that the problem with taking putative healthy mitochondria from a donor is 
that uh, this new combination of DNA may end up being the wrong combination with other problems emerging. What kind of problems could we see from this therapy? Well, um, we know from work in flies, which is um, maybe a bit of a distant model of humans, but we know that the, the principle that um, uh, males in particular may, be, may suffer if there are... Um, if there is a mismatch between the mitochondrial genome and the nuclear genome. So they, they produce, um, there's a small number of genes, but they produce important products and they interact with products from the nucleus. And um, because of that tight relationship, there's a lot of, um, over a long evolutionary period of time, we, we end up with a very tight relationship. So problems are compensated for in one or the other. So if we rip that apart experimentally and stick in a new mitochondria, it might be the wrong fit for the mm. nucleus, so it's those kinds of, you might get problems from that procedure. I see. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Cool. So um, just to go over again, so what is the difference between mitochondrial DNA and nucleic DNA? Uh, Wow. Well, um, in simple terms, there's, <laughs> in simple terms, it's much, much smaller. So the, the human genome, I guess, has maybe 20,000 genes. The mitochondrial mm. genome has 37, I think, oh, okay. a very small number. And um, it's, it's just very small. It's and completely uh, different, really. It's yeah, not, it's, it, not although many similarities it, at all. Although the fundamentals of what it's, how it's built, the, you know, the, the yeah. code is the same. So it's the same material, mm. just a very different size and very different um, composition. Yeah. Mm. Um, so you mentioned in your paper that um, the problems with introducing this mitochondrial DNA could affect males more than females. What's the reason for that? So um, the reason for that, we think, comes from the, the way in which mitochondrial genome gets inherited. So mothers pass on the mitochondrial genome to their offspring. The father's mitochondrial genome basically gets ditched. The, sp the sperm only um, pass on the nuclear DNA. Mm. So because of that way, that pattern of inheritance, that means that if there are mutations in the mitochondrial genome which only cause problems for males, they don't cause any problem for females, then selection can't eliminate them. So they could mm. build up in the mitochondrial genome and then um, um, those problems will only appear in males, there's no mm. selection that can happen. So it's, a, it's an evolutionary process. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and will it ever be safe to be uh, used in clinical settings, like hospitals? Well, one way round the pr we pointed out a problem, and the one way round the problem is if we make a better match. If if people um, um, are able to work out wh where's the mismatch coming from, and then make a better match, we can sequence genomes, sequence mitochondrial, mitochondrial genomes very easily now. So that kind of tinkering or fine-tuning of the technique could bypass some of the potential problems we point out. Mm, so that's then it could be the future then. Yeah. yeah, well, thank you very much for that yeah. interview. That was okay. great. Um, now coming up next, uh, we've got a little report about Santa. Have you ever wondered why Santa has red cheeks? I have, because it's cold and he yeah. should be freezing. Well, Cheska's going to tell us more about this. Going outside on a cold winter night is enough to make anyone chilly, and I'm sure Father Christmas is no exception. But why is it that Santa has such rosy cheeks? Well, I'm here to explain just that. Humans are designed to live in warm climates. It's mainly our behavioural adaptations which enable us to habituate in the cold. For example, we can build appropriate shelters or wear warm clothes. When a warm-blooded human finds itself in cold surroundings, physiological responses occur to maintain a core body temperature. These physiological responses, which are all part of thermoregulation, are intended to keep your body warm. These include shivering, goosebumps and vasoconstriction. Most important to the issue of red cheeks is vasoconstriction. This is the shrinking of the blood vessels and arterioles which supply the skin's surface with blood. This reaction redirects blood away from the extremities and towards the vital organs. By redirecting blood away from the skin, it reduces heat loss through radiation. As a result of limited blood flow, the skin will initially go pale, as expected. But why is it then we get rosy cheeks or a red nose when we are exposed to the cold temperatures? Well, it's due to the fact that vasoconstriction actually occurs intermittently with vasodilation in low temperatures. If vasoconstriction was constant, then frostbite could occur. This is when the skin is damaged by ice crystals forming inside the live cells, which in turn kills them. Therefore
therefore, in the cold, dilation of the arterioles occurs periodically due to a decrease in the release of neurotransmitters from the sympathetic nervous system. This increases the blood flow back to the skin, supplying it with oxygen and nutrients. This alternating vasoconstriction and vasodilation in cold weather is known as the Lewis-Hunting reaction and was discovered in 1930. It's what's responsible for the skin flushing red in cold weather. So that explains why Santa has red cheeks when he delivers your presents at Christmas. Welcome back. So we're going to do a little experiment on brain freeze. You might be wondering why I've got a lab coat on. Just health and safety and all that, you know. I didn't care about those guys. Okay, so we've got, we've got Robin, Flo and Nick. So the way we're going to do the experiment, first of all, I'm just going to explain what brain freeze is, to do the science part of it, behind, uh, first of all. So uh, you might be wondering what brain freeze actually is. Uh, it's got the scientific name for it, is sphenopalatine ganglio neuralgia. A very confusing name. I'll explain it a little bit more. So in the palate at the roof of your mouth, you've got the sphenopalatine ganglia. And this is uh, what is affected due to the cold that you get from brain freeze. So for example, these guys have got ice in their cups. So when the ice reaches the, uh, reaches the palate at the roof of their mouth, this will cause a cold sensation. And that's the one that reacts. So brain freeze is just a headache, but it's rapid on its onset. So there's blood vessels, there's many blood vessels in the roof of your mouth. Um, one, of the main, one of the brain's main supply of oxygenated blood, the anterior cerebral artery. This was, there was a big study on this in 2012 by a man called George Acerador at Harvard Medical School. And they've only just really kind of found out what brain freeze actually is. It's a very useful thing to study because people who've got migraines, uh, they tend to be more susceptible to brain freeze, and brain freeze is very easy to just induce in a patient. So they can give them brain freeze, and then that's be like the study. So what actually happens in the brain? Uh, the anterior cerebral artery dilates. This leads to an increase in blood flow, which is followed by the pain. When the artery returns to its normal size, the blood flow returned to normal, and there was a cessation in pain. So yeah, we're going to start with the experiment. So what I'm going to ask these guys to do is I'm going to have Robin being the control. So he's just going to eat the ice cube, and then we'll do nothing and just wait. Then Flo, you're going to eat the ice cube and then have some of your hot drink. And then Nick's just going to eat the ice cube and then he's going to put the tongue to the roof of the mouth. So what I'm going to ask you guys to do is raise your hands when you start sensing the brain freeze and i ask you guys to lower your hands when, you're, when you've stopped sensing the brain freeze. So you guys ready to go? Yeah. It's quite, yeah, it's not the funniest thing in the world to do. Yeah, just yeah. go for it. If you think you can get two in your mouth. <laughs> and just kind of put it, try and keep it to the top of your roof of your mouth. So what's happening right now is the uh, blood vessels at the roof of your mouth are starting to, uh, con they're starting to dilate. So there's more blood flow going around. Oh, this is when you, oh you're starting to feel it. So as soon as you start feeling it, so if you want to get rid of the ice cubes. <laughs> So if you, want to, if you want to do your hot drink and then put the tongue to your roof of your mouth. So what's happening now is a hot drink and putting the tongue to the roof of your mouth is trying to equal out the, the pain and equal out the temperature. So yeah, Nick, has it stopped for you? Yeah. Flo? You think it's... Just about, yeah. Just about stopped. Mm -hmm. You still got a bit... Still a bit, yeah. Still a bit. Yeah. <laughs> it's going now. It's going now. So yeah, that's a bit of science for you guys. Um, and yeah, so I hope you enjoyed that. Don't try this at home because you might get cold, wet and might get brain freeze which isn't the nicest thing in the world to have. Next up, have you ever wondered about the science behind musical instruments? The violin was invented over 500 years ago in Italy by lute maker Andrea Amati and today is one of the most popular instruments for children to learn. A single violin body is made up of over 70 separate components and it's vital that they fit together precisely to create the right sound. The sound of a violin is created when the hairs of the bow move across the strings, like this, or when you pluck the string. As the strings begin to vibrate, the air directly surrounding them is compressed and a sound wave begins to start. This is the bridge. It may look like it's just for structural support, but it's actually very important for the sound because it transmits vibrations from the strings to the upper surface of the violin. The body of the violin acts a bit like an amplifier. 
As the strings vibrate, the air inside the body also vibrates and makes the sound audible. The tension of the strings is very important for producing the right pitch. Violinists use these tuning pegs, here and here, to tighten and loosen the strings. A tighter string will vibrate more quickly, resulting in a sound of a higher pitch. The strings also have different thicknesses, so the thickest one on this side produces the lowest pitch and the thinnest one on this side produces the highest pitch. The frequency of the vibrations can also be changed by stopping the string and changing its length. You can create different sounds called harmonics by lightly stopping the string at certain intervals along its length. The mathematical ratio of these intervals was first discovered by Pythagoras. Here's what it sounds like. The idea is that you keep the string at virtually the same tension, but you make it shorter, resulting in a high-pitched sound. A vibrating string doesn't just produce one single frequency. It's actually simultaneously vibrating at several different frequencies, which produces the timbre of the instrument. That's what makes a violin sound different to a piano or a trumpet. Welcome back to Battle of the Brains. Now this second round is called Guess the News and it's going to test your knowledge of all the latest research in science. So you've both got cards on your table and when you turn them over there will be uh, headlines from the, latest, from the last week of science and it will have a caption but you'll have some words missing. So I'll read it out to you and when you think of the word that you think might fill in the missing gap, uh, play your musical instruments and then say what you think the word is. Yeah, you're good for that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so ready when you are? And turn over your first card. Okay, so the cry of a baby. No, men are genetically programmed to get emotional about what, claim scientists? What do you think men might get emotional about? Yep, can you suck? Babies crying? It's not babies crying, but it's very close to the article actually, so keep thinking, what might men really like? Nothing really bad. Uh, stress. <laughs> no, 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 stress. <laughs> Keep guessing, guys. Oh, colds. Yes. Colds? Yes. Man <laughs> it's a nice idea. Um, playing with their baby. It's not playing with their baby. It's not, it's not baby related. What would men like? Engineering. I think motors. Oh. Um, cars. cars. <laughs> I'm going to have to give it because you blew the whistle, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yes, a study showed that men's emotions are more likely to be triggered when viewing a beautiful car than when seeing a baby cry. <laughs> Would you like to flip over the next card? Yep, next card over. And couples that what together stay together. What do you think? <laughs> I'm going to say it's to do with ingestion. Of something. Eat together. <laughs> Not quite eat. Drink. <laughs> Drink. Oh. <laughs> this is doing well at this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, studies showed that divorce rates were actually significantly higher when one person in the couple was a heavy drinker. Yep. Okay, number three. <laughs> okay, humans evolved after a female what mated with a what? This is an extraordinary claim. Yeah. Uh, it's like Neanderthal and. It's not that, no. It's actually something really obscure. It's, um, I'll give you a clue. It's something to do with farmyards. Yes. And a female chicken mated with a pig? Pig is the last one. I'll give you, yeah, I'll give you one point for the pig. What would the female be? Cow. This is actually to do with our evolutionary history, actually. It's, um, it would be a monkey. It would, yeah, it's chimpanzee. Yeah. I don't you have that. But um, yeah, a, um, a, a recent <laughs> Dr. McCarthy, um, an expert in the field of animal hybridization, has theorized that humans diverged when an offspring of a male pig and a female chimpanzee was created, supposedly. <laughs> okay, number four. It's from the Metro Online, and it stunned doctors discover what growing inside a baby's ear canal. Was it a feather? It wasn't a feather, it was very close to a feather. Is something of that variety. Plant. Um, scale? It's not scale. <laughs> it's more along the lines of plant. Was it a leaf? No, it's a type of... A fungus? No, it's a type... I think it's a type of flower. 
Very close with the feather. <laughs> you blow them. When you're a child, you blow them. Dandelion. Yes, dandelion. <laughs> this is in China. A startling discovery was made when a mother brought in her daughter who'd been suffering with a persistent ear infection for the last four months. The dandelion had grown to nearly two centimetres long in her ear canal. <laughs> Pretty incredible. <laughs> OK, next one. OK, what helps hunt for alien worlds? Telescopes. No, it's not <laughs> telescopes. No, yeah, it should be telescopes. It's a subject you may have done at school. That's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> what could you use? A method that you may use to try and find other planets. If you're going to find a probability of how many planets there may be. Statistics. It's math. So a mathematical crime fighter, I'll give you that one. It probably was quite hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's proved that, um, yeah, shown that actually um, statistical probability um, helps us to figure out how many of the exoplanets may actually be genuine worlds. So, yeah. That was me. <laughs> okay, and uh, number six, turn it over. So, what will give you a shorter and more stressful life if you are a what? Um, is it sex and if you're a fly? Yes, it is! Very nicely done. <laughs> <laughs> it's sexual frustration will give you a shorter and more stressful life if you are a fruit fly. In an experiment where flies were allowed to mate and others were not, those who were left sexually frustrated led 40% shorter lives compared to those who were allowed to mate. Oh, <laughs> And I think that's all we've got time for now, unfortunately. But uh, we'll look at the results of that round at the end of the show. So, next we're going to move on to something mystical, with Hannah explaining to us something about hallucinations. We think we know what hallucinations are and who has them. For example, it is commonly believed to be an indicator of a serious mental illness. We think that people who see or hear things that aren't there must be mad. However, one interesting study back in 2000 found that they are actually pretty common. They estimated that a third of us have experienced one, with 20% of the population experiencing one at least once a month. So if they are very common, what are they, where do they come from and why do we have them? The definition of an hallucination is that it is the perception of something that is not there. It is usually located around the person experiencing it, making the perception very real and giving it the qualities of a real perception, making the hallucination very vivid. They are different from dreaming because they can take place whilst awake and fully conscious. They are also different from illusions which manipulate real perceptions. They are also said to be different from delusions or delusional thoughts, which are real perceptions that are given greater significance or are bizarrely exaggerated. Hallucinations don't necessarily mean seeing things. They can occur in all of your senses. This means that you can have hallucinations of sound, smell, taste, touch, temperature, your perception of time, your perception of your balance, and of pain. Mild hallucinations are called disturbances and they can also happen in all of the senses I have just mentioned. They can also include things such as movement in your peripheral vision or hearing a faint noise. Hallucinations are common when falling asleep or waking up. And these types of hallucinations are considered normal. Where one when you are waking up is called hypnagogic and one when you are falling asleep is called hypnopompic. These kinds of hallucinations are caused by entering or leaving a drowsy state of consciousness, which is different from dreaming because you are not asleep. Other causes of hallucinations are thought to be associated with sleep deprivation, drug use, especially hallucinogens such as LSD and ketamine, psychosis and disorders such as schizophrenia. But as we have discovered, hallucinations are actually very common. So as you fall asleep this Christmas Eve, don't worry if you think you've seen Santa and his reindeers. Welcome back. We've been kindly joined by the Ukulele Society who are going to play us a science-themed song. After that, we're going to go to an ad break, but don't go anywhere and don't forget to keep sending us your science jokes at hashtag UniTVScience. Take it away. <laughs> Control to nature's 
Okay, let's get the show on the road. Present arms. I know the feeling. Is that so? Don't you worry because... One ammo! Now just watch the power of God cure this man. The power of Christ compels you! What the bloody hell was that? I said raise your arms, you fools. Hello, this is Sophie Howard reporting for Uni TV. So 
welcome back to Science Uncovered Live. Hope you enjoyed that um, ukulele society and the ad break that we just had. Do make sure that you check out some of our other uni TV shows like Let's Cook and News Hit. Um, so, uh, yeah, have we got the results of the quiz? Yeah, the results have just come in and currently it's 8-5. So QSOCCER winning 8-5. Oh, so, yeah, life sciences need to catch up in the next round. And, uh, Hannah, have we got um, any more tweets? Yes, and jokes we and have. We've got some tweets. My sister has tweeted in. Thanks, Katie. She <laughs> says, what did the root say to the tree? What, what does the root say to the tree? I want to be just like you when I grow up. Oh. <laughs> That's quite sweet, actually. <laughs> Great one. Um, uh, for our friend Stavros um, from UniTV has said, renewable energy, I'm a big fan. <laughs> Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's I think they're getting better, actually. They are. Um, <laughs> Resna funny. has said a really good one. What's the unit of power? What? What? <laughs> <laughs> that's really good. Yeah, we keep them coming in. They're really great. <laughs> right, yeah. so... Um, yeah, here's what's coming up uh, in the second half of the show. Uh, first up, we've got an experiment. I'm going to be teaching James and Hannah how to make oobleck, um, and you'll find out what that is when I tell you in a bit. Uh, we've also got an exclusive interview from Natasha Sagala um, and another interview from Hans Kronberg, uh, um, both research scientists at the University of Sussex. Uh, we've got the third round of Battle of the Brains with Cheska and the Life Sciences and QSOC, so hopefully life sciences can catch up um, and we'll have another big finale performance from the ukulele society i'm really excited about that it's a science themed christmas song which i just think is going to be, be amazing, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh but first up we will be um having a weather report from megan hello and welcome to the weather insight today we'll be looking at snowflakes what are they and how do they form Snowflakes are single or aggregated ice crystals that fall through the Earth's atmosphere. Their complex and delicate structure arises from ice, which is nature's simplest hydrogen bonded crystal. No two snowflakes are the same. Each snowflake forms in a different way. However, the initiation of snowflakes begins the same. All snowflakes need low temperatures, water vapour and the presence of a dust particle in order to form. As liquid water evaporates and rises, it condenses around falling dust particles, creating clouds. When temperatures are low enough, so zero degrees or below, the water freezes and creates ice crystals, and these ice crystals form the nucleus of the snowflakes. The nucleus grows in size as more water vapour condenses on the particle, and ice crystallisation occurs. As these water molecules bond together, they form a regular crystalline lattice in the shape of a prism, which has six-fold symmetry. All snowflakes form in this way, which is why snowflakes have six sides. The next stage of snowflake development is the growth of arms, or branches, caused by ice growing faster at the edges. Once these branches are formed, different temperature regimes affect the growth. For example, around minus 13 degrees C, the branches narrow, and around minus 14 degrees C, side branches form. As the ice crystals fall to the ground, they pass through different temperatures and humidity, governing how they develop in terms of size and shape. The atmosphere variability therefore produces the wide variety of snowflake shapes, ranging from prisms to needles and to lacy snowflakes. The more complex the snowflake, the more variability in conditions experienced. So thanks to Megan for that special weather report all about snowflakes. So next up, I'm really, I've been excited about this all day, we're going to be making oobleck. Now it's called oobleck, um, I believe it was in a Dr. Zeus book, um, and yeah, someone named it oobleck. It's basically, um, if you want to start mixing, uh, you need to put just everything in the bowl. So it's two glasses of corn flour oh, and one that. glass of water. So we're going, we're going for two, two of these? Yeah. Yep. Straight All in. All in, Ooh. yeah. Ooh, Maybe leave some water behind oh. just in case. Oh. There's a tiny oh. bit, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Go um, for it. So, oobleck, what is it? If you want to start mixing there. Oh. Can we do the other What one? it is. Yes. Oh. Um, well, was it, we could, oh, that's really weird. Uh, that's like, <laughs> what it is, um, it is well? a liquid that's got Ooh. inconsistent viscosity. <laughs> viscosity? Yeah, so whereas water Ooh. has got a consistent viscosity and you can pour it and it just flows, oobleck, when you mix it up, it looks kind of like a liquid, but as you will see in a minute, yeah, get right in there, yeah, mix it all up, as you will Should see, <laughs> uh. <laughs> it's really sticky. it actually, oh. um, when you sort of 
punch it or Can squish I have a go it at together. It? Oh, Hang it? on a sec. Oh. When you squish it together, <laughs> um, it actually becomes a solid. So yeah, it changes from liquid to solid in literally seconds. So are we almost there with it? Um, I think I've got most of it. It's all yeah, sticking at the it's bottom. It's all stuck at the bottom, isn't it? Mm. Keep mixing, and I'll yep. explain a bit more. Yeah. Can we tell so, um, it for a bit? Water um, is actually a <laughs> Newtonian liquid, and this is known as a non-Newtonian liquid because mm -hmm. of its inconsistent viscosity. Um, are we there? Nearly there? It's, it's looking, it's looking like know. icing sugar. Go on, James. Have a have a. Oh, it's like milk. A bit, yeah, doesn't yeah. it? The oublet. It's sort of sure it's, there's, there's there's some oublet for you. <laughs> you guys have it. Yeah, just pop that there. So am I, am I just go yeah, for a punch? Yeah, yeah, just go for it. Oh, that's really oh. weird. <laughs> weird. I was expecting it? it to splash over my dress. <laughs> it doesn't, like, it's oh. like... Uh, oh. It reacts in a really strange so way. So it's, it's kind of like, oh, it's, it's, it feels like it's got stuff in it. Mm. So is that the cornflower? What's that about? So what's happened here... Really good. Um, oh, it's a suspension. It so... <laughs> This is quite fun, actually. <laughs> you can try this at home if you want to. It's this, great this fun. I'm going to try. I've kept one. Oh, let me take this ring off. Take the ring. I will <laughs> just, that. just ruin the table. So, yeah, it's a suspension instead of a solution. Just leave it there. So <gasps> when you put your sugar in your tea, really that makes a solution and it all yeah. dissolves. But when you put the corn flour into the water, the particles are suspended in the liquid. Yeah, go on, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so what that oh. means is that when you punch it, all those particles are still there and they just compress together and make it into a solid. Oh. It's really, really weird. Really weird. Isn't it? I'm gonna have to get in there. I'm gonna have Give to. Give it a go. Oh, oh, I'm stepping me... back, stepping back. Here we go. We've already, oh, got, we've, oh. Already, oh. <laughs> we've already got a nice oh, floor. So weird. Oh, these, oh, these are being We've moved. made a bit of a mess. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's a really <laughs> weird substance. Oh. Mm. Um, yeah, it's I like can't say It's fun, more, really. it's very fun. You should definitely do it at home. So what do you need? Just corn flour and... <laughs> you need two parts corn flour, one part water. Mix it all together and punch it. Oh, wow. And you'll have the time of your life. <laughs> yeah, it's good stress relief, that one. <laughs> yeah. So what have we got coming up next, James? Oh, we, what, well, what have we got coming up next? After that, it's throw me off. <laughs> um, so I was lucky enough to get an interview with Sussex neuroscientist uh, Natasha Sagala to find out about her recently published research paper on a, a maths genius. I'm interviewing Dr Natasha Sagala, Senior Lecturer in Neuroscience here at Brighton Sussex Medical School and at Sussex. So Natasha, tell us a little bit more about yourself. I'm a neuroscientist here at the Medical School at Sussex University and I'm interested in higher brain functions like memory, attention, visual perception and I'm interested in healthy volunteers but also in people who have problems with their memory, uh, people with early dementia. And I study them both in terms of their behaviour, how they perform in what we call psychophysical tasks, but I also like to have a peek inside their brain while they do those tasks and I use a scanner to do that. So we perform what we call um, fMRI studies, that's functional magnetic resonance imaging studies. So the study you co-authored um, titled Effective Connectivity Reveals Strategy Differences in an Expert Calculator. Um, the aim of the study was to see if in an expert calculator a person like Husner who has this very special ability of finding out the exact date, the exact day of the week for whatever date you give them, um, how he can solve this task because uh, usually this ability it's quite rare and you find it in people who have some sort of autism so um, they have problems in other areas of cognition uh, perhaps they're not able to explain how they do it or they have issues with social or emotional functions but Yusne is a perfectly uh, normal person in terms of being sociable, articulate. He can tell you exactly how he solves the task. Um, he solves each of these problems in about two seconds. And he used to hold a world record for that. He could find up to 93 um, days for different dates problems in under a minute. So y you can see that he had practiced a lot uh, and he still practiced for hours every day. So in this very special person, we wanted to see if it was um, a very special ability that had some kind of signature in either the brain structure, 
is his brain built in a completely different way or does it work in a completely different way when he solves these tasks. So we had him do these tasks in the scanner, so we were able to see his brain function while he was doing these tasks, both for problems that we know he practices on a daily basis because that's the kind of problems he's tested on in the international competitions that he attends, and problems that are similar in nature but he doesn't practice. So we wanted to see the effect of this practice and familiarity and if his brain was functioning in a different way. You talked about your results a little bit. What do you think your results showed? So the results showed that for the problems that he could solve easily because he had practiced them a lot, he had access to, if you like, a privileged memory network, what we call long-term working memory. So you can think of that a bit in computer terms. So you have your RAM memory and you have your hard disk. And because of this excessive practice that he's been doing for years and he still does on a daily basis, he can use parts of the hard disk in a RAM-like fashion. So he had stored shortcuts and strategies uh, in that part of the brain. For the things that he hasn't practiced, so he had to come up with different ways um, and convert the unfamiliar problems to familiar problems, so he had to use extra steps and be more clever about it, if you like. So there he used the prefrontal cortex, so a part of the brain that allows him to think about the strategy, how to approach it, and then go back to his familiar strategies after he's converted the problem to a familiar kind of question. So I think it's important because it shows that even a very practiced and very clever person like Yusnia still needs the benefits of practice to be able to solve the familiar um, problems well. And when he doesn't have this benefit of practice, he will just do what every one of us does when we have difficulties with certain problems. He will use those higher cortical areas, the prefrontal cortex, the parietal cortex, to come up with a strategy on how what I already know can help me solve that problem. So the idea is that if he had been practicing those problems that we gave him and were unfamiliar, he would be just as fast and as good at them. So with the unfamiliar problems, he was about 70% accurate, while with the familiar ones, he was 98% accurate. If you gave him an X number of weeks to practice on those problems, he would be 98% accurate across all of them. And the parts of the brain that were involved for the unfamiliar problems, like the prefrontal cortex, would probably shut down eventually because those problems would become familiar and he would be able to access those long-term storage brain areas to solve those problems as well. So you see a response of the brain to learning. So do you think he's just in a special case or do you think we can all strive to be like Yusnia with his amazing skill? Well I think Yusnia is a very special case but there are things we can all learn from, from him. So the fact that he still needs to practice his problems three, four hours every day it simply means that to stay on top of your game, you really need to continue putting time and effort in whatever it is that you want to be good at and not simply rest on your laurels and something will happen automatically. So I think we can all definitely learn from his approach of hard work and zeal in that direction. So thank you very much for that extremely interesting interview, Natasha. Thank you very much, my pleasure. Hello and welcome back to Battle of the Brains. Sadly, this is our third and final round. It's gone so fast. <laughs> now, currently, QSOC, you are in the lead with eight points. <laughs> it's pretty good. And Life Sciences, you are with five points. Now, how do you feel about that? Do you think you can bring it back? Do you think you can win? I feel extremely confident. We were just okay. giving them a head start. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well this next round is quick fire questions, so you'll probably be able to tot up a lot of points. So whenever, I'm going to read out a question, whenever you think you know the right answer, knock on the table first, and then say it. Okay? Everyone ready? Yep. And first question is, what comes first, thunder or lightning? Lightning. Yep. <laughs> How many legs does a butterfly have? Six. Yep, correct. Oh <laughs> <laughs> are frogs reptiles or amphibians? Uh, amphibians? Amphibians. That was a hard one. I don't think I can judge that. <laughs> That's a draw, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay, number four. How many colours does a rainbow have? One of the spectrum, but seven many colours. Very well done. It's, yeah, it was a trick <laughs> question. It's a spectrum. <laughs> oh, because you're doing very well. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, number five. Which is a natural satellite of the Earth? The moon? Oh, sorry. I was going to say the moon or the sun? 
moon. <laughs> the moon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fossils are found mainly in which type of rock? Would it be sedimentary rock? Sedimentary, sedimentary rock. Thank you. <laughs> oh, God, <laughs> science is. I have it. I'm still confident. <laughs> okay. I'll skip to question then. <laughs> okay, number seven. What is the common name for a Bombus terrestris? <laughs> we were talking about this earlier. Bumblebee? It is a bumblebee! <laughs> <laughs> oh, a so cute. Oh, that's the thing. <laughs> Number eight. What is the formula for speed? Speed equals distance divided by time. Yep, that's correct. I thought you meant the drug <laughs> speed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going there. It's not, not that film. type of show. <laughs> Okay, number nine. In evolution, what does the name Luca stand for? In evolution. L U C A. Is that um, a name given to one of our ancestors from yes. several million years ago? The ape like creature? It wasn't an, an ape like yeah. creature, uh, no, but you're very close with the ancestor thing. Yeah. Spell it out. It's L U C A, Luca. <laughs> I don't know. Would you like to pass on that question? <laughs> okay, it was actually the last universal common ancestor, so it's an amoeba-like ancestor that we all diverged from. Oh, okay, so that one goes to no one. <laughs> okay, number 10. Alfred Wegener's observation that the continents may have once been connected led to a specific theory in the early 20th century. What was this theory called? Plate tectonic shift. It was continental drift, so yeah, no, okay. as long as I'll okay. give you that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, number 11. The Hardy-Weinberg law predicts that the genetics of a population will remain in equilibrium as long as there is no... Is it A, asexual reproduction, or B, genetic drift? Genetic drift? You said it, yeah, well done. <laughs> okay, number 12. What is kinetic energy? It is, it is the energy something has when it's moving, when particles have when they're in movement. Okay. You did knock at the same time there. I'm not quite sure who to give that one to, but I'll um, answer some people later. <laughs> okay. 13. Name a vestigial body part in the human digestive system. Intestine. It's not vestigial. We I'm use that one quite a lot. Okay. Vestigial is one that we um, used to have use for. Appendix? Uh, yes, the appendix. <laughs> <laughs> okay, number 14. How far is the sun from the Earth? Is it 15 billion kilometres or 150 million kilometres? 150 million. 150 million is correct. <laughs> okay, number 15. What law describes the relationship between the pressure and a volume of a gas? Ideal gas law. Um, specifically, what's that Chinese? No, that's Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law, yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. <laughs> but I mean, very physics-y. That was actually the last question, I'm afraid. I think this is society did. That went by very quickly. I think <laughs> very quickly. But um, thank you both so much for playing. Thank we'll um, confirm the actual results and the scores later mm -hmm. on in the show. But you both did absolutely brilliantly. <laughs> okay, next up, here's a little story all about the Human Genome Project. The story of the human genome started 60 years ago with two young, eminent scientists in the old Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. Here, James Watson and Francis Crick propose a hypothesis of the double helix model of DNA. DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, is a fundamental hereditary molecule of all living organisms. The discovery is based on works of many scientists, such as Frederick Meischer, Nikolai Kortstoff, William Asprey, Rosalind Franklin and many others. The project to map the human genome began in 1990 and was completed in April 2003. The genome stands for all the genetic material in a cell or organism, and in this case, Homo sapiens. The human genome contains 3.2 billion base pairs. Each base can either be adenine, guanine, thymine or cysteine and these bond together to form polypeptide chains, which are used to create the proteins that underpin life. The race to map the genome kicked off in 1999, when Talira Genomics, a private company run by Craig Venter, wanted to challenge the Wellcome Trust and the Sanger Institute, who worked as part of the Human Genome Project. Talira Genomics planned to patent up to 500 genes, whereas a publicly funded Human Genome Project wanted to keep them all available 
for scientists and researchers to access. The race was won by the Human Genome Project. They successfully documented the code of the entire genome. Technology has massively changed the process of mapping. It now takes just two days to map the entire genome, compared to the 13 years it took to map the first. So next, uh, we're now joined by Dr. Hans Kronberg, who um, is a senior lecturer in psychology. And you're going to talk to us about drug addiction. So um, Hans, just so the viewers at home can understand your role and what you do, uh, what do you do at the University of Sussex? I, um, I divide my time between sort of research, which is sort of the primary thing that I do, teaching. Um, I teach two courses at the university here. Um, as well as, as we all have to do academics, some administrative work. Mm. <laughs> Not <my> favourite. <laughs> so your area of expertise is addiction. What yeah. made you interested in this topic? Uh, well, if I'm honest, I sort of rolled into it. I had to do an internship as a student and I ended up in the lab studying behavioural neuroscience of addiction. Um, but it's an interesting topic for many, many reasons. I think one of the things why it's really interesting for psychologists is because it is a very strange phenomenon of people that by all objective means have a, a pretty difficult life, oftentimes on the street getting in trouble with the police, lots of health problems associated, that seemingly voluntarily take a drug and keep taking it. It's a real strange conundrum and that's interesting for a psychologist. Mm. Mm -hmm. So how does addiction occur? Well, perhaps the first thing to say is that Drugs are not necessarily addictive. It's really a complex interplay between various different factors, set and setting, as we oftentimes refer to it, so the person itself and the environmental circumstances in which you take the drug. Lots of us take drugs, for instance, alcohol is the classic example. Mm. Few of us become addicted to it, so it's not the drug per se that makes it addictive. It's these interactions between the person, the setting, and the drug. That makes, drug, that makes a drug potentially addictive. So it has to be a combination of several it factors. It certainly has yeah. to be a combination, yes. Mm. What is the actual definition of addiction? The definition of addiction. It's one of these things that's difficult to find even though, define even though we all know what it is and we all recognize it. Um, but what we can say is that it's not the same as just drug taking. Again, we all drink alcohol, few of us become addicted to alcohol. So we define addiction as one, a compulsive pattern of drug taking despite the negative consequences and two, a high susceptibility to relapse. Sometimes up to 70 percent of addicts, former addicts, will eventually relapse. Although those numbers are actually quite controversial. Mm. Okay. Um, so, uh, which drug is the most dangerous in terms of the potential of becoming mm. addicted to it? Again, it's a little bit the same answer. It's not so much a drug that's necessarily addictive. It's this complex interplay between mm. drugs and the person and the environment. But there are certainly certain drugs that people will take regularly for pleasure. Think, for instance, of marijuana. Think, for instance, of hallucinogens that we don't think produce the kind of addictive pattern what I just described compulsive drug taking behavior. People take them, but they're not quite addictive. Some drugs, yes, maybe some ways that we take drugs, smoking drugs, injecting drugs, tends to make them more addictive. Okay. Are there any personality factors that would make you more addictive, um, you're more vulnerable to addiction? There's lots of factors that we think are involved. One is, for instance, whether perhaps you're a novelty seeker, as we describe it, whether you're someone that will go out and seek some sort of excitement in your life, that may be a factor. Impulsivity is a factor that we think plays an important role. Some people are more impulsive than others, naturally. Mm. Impulsive people may be more susceptible to take drugs, and when they take drugs, they're more likely to become addictive. And there's also sex differences. Females tend to become much quicker addicted to drugs than males do. They have a much harder time getting off the drugs, even though many more men take drugs than females, but that probably has to do with, for instance, novelty seekers, which men tend to be more. Mm. So if there's these sort of novelty seekers and people with maybe higher impulsivity, mm -hmm. um, are they more likely to be um, 
uh, become addicted to other things like so we've got drugs I mean I've heard a lot about sort of internet addiction sure. those sorts of things sure well there's not a lot of research I think in terms of whether drug addicts are necessarily also likely to become addicts to other mm. things partly because they are drug addicts and that is what they do they seek drugs and that cons is mainly their life mm. but there are certain commonalities certainly uh, commonalities between drug addiction and other types of addictions. That's very new research and we don't really know if it's truly similar mm. or it just looks similar. Sometimes when two things look similar, they actually are not yeah, similar. Yeah, it might not be causation, yeah. Um, so for your career, yeah. what has been your most significant and maybe best finding that you've mm. discovered? Significant, not in a statistical sense, but in no, a no, no, <laughs> yeah. colloquial sense in that yeah. case. Well, it's not. I, I'm not a t type of researcher that necessarily uh, uh, is sort of a does that kind of high flying research. It's really sort of a body of evidence uh, or a body of studies that I've that I've produced over the years, which really has to do with this question: How are the effects of drugs modulated by what I call non-pharmacological factors, things other than the drug, like the environmental setting? And it turns out, if you set up the experiment correctly, that you can almost make the drug effect disappear if you give it under a certain circumstance, in a certain environment, namely if you give it to subjects when they are at home. Mm. Mm. Okay. If they're sort of quiet and at home, drugs do actually very little. So mm. it's the environment that determines what drugs do to a large extent. Oh, that's really interesting. So, yeah, drugs may not have the effects that a lot of people kind of attach to them. Depending on the environment. Yeah, yeah. depending. Yes. Um, so finally, do you think uh, research into drug addiction can um, help overcome the stereotypes mm. that are attached to, to people who take drugs? Certainly it can, but it can also make it worse, of course. Mm. And I think right now, especially in the United States, the idea that drugs change your brain, that s addicts may be a victim, if you will, to the changes that occur in their brain, has been very, very popular, what we call the disease model. Mm. Um, and much less so in the United Kingdom, in fact. It's much more viewed here as sort of a combination between changes in your brain and the fact that you do have voluntary control, that you may be able to control your urges in a sense. I think that view may be actually shifting a little bit. I think we're shifting away a little bit from the disease perspective, a little bit more to the perhaps addicts are capable of making decisions themselves. And they have the ability to stop taking drugs. Keep in mind, lots of people stop taking drugs. They stop mm, smoking, yeah. they stop drinking, for instance, because they get a family, or they have children, or they get a job. Mm. You can get off of drugs, but it's very difficult. I suppose if the environment changes. If the environment yeah, changes, that may be a fact. Mm. Right, well, thank you so much, Hans, you. um, for really giving us a bit more of an insight into addiction. Uh, next up, have you ever wondered why we give gifts at Christmas? Cheska's going to tell yeah. us why. Gift giving is a large part of many cultures around the world, and most of us are bound to experience it during the month of December. But why do we actually give each other gifts? With survival of the fittest being a key theory in the world of science, it seems strange that any individual would waste resources on a creature other than itself. But gift giving is not unique to our species. There are actually many functions to giving a gift. For example, in the mate selection of birds, Males will present females with food or other items to increase their likelihood of mating with them. Also, social creatures will usually be generous towards others in their species as a result of their relatedness. For instance, in some bee and ant societies, individuals will forego their reproductive capabilities in order to boost the reproductive opportunities of others in their kin group. In both these examples, however, Generosity is directed towards those who are related to the individual, so that they can help to pass on their shared genes. Humans, on the other hand, will give gifts to each other without an increased reproductive value being the underlying cause. In other words, we give gifts to people who are not related to ourselves. But why do we bother to do this? 
It is due to a term called upstream reciprocity. Upstream reciprocity can lead to societal cooperation and is experimentally shown to work in a network. You are more likely to give to someone who will give to someone else, who will in turn give to someone else, and so on. This is like the idea of what goes around comes around. If you do something good for someone, then hopefully someone else will do something good for you. Experiments and mathematical analyses carried out by professors of Harvard and California universities show that we often express our gratitude by being more charitable towards others. Therefore, you are more likely to give presents if you receive them. To put it simply, we give gifts to others not to increase our reproductive success, but because we have evolutionarily selected for a nature that initiates altruistic acts in the hope that they will be reciprocated. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that little bit about gift giving. Unfortunately, we're now coming towards the end of the show. Oh, that's very sad. <laughs> um, as you can see behind us, we've got the Ukulele Society back with us. They're all ready for their grand finale. Uh, but first, Cheska, what was the end result of the quiz? Who won? Well, Q Socks, Chris and Louie did very well with 17 points to Life Sciences 9. So oh, <laughs> oh, well, well done, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> did really well. <laughs> Uh, yes. I guess, have we got any tweets? <laughs> yes, I've got some final jokes for everyone. So this is from James. If I were an enzyme, I'd be DNA helicase, so I can unzip your genes. Oh, that's, <laughs> oh. <good. laughs> that's a bit. And then we've got another one here. Have you heard the one about the sick chemist? If you can't helium and you can't curium, you'll probably have to bury them. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they've been brilliant. Thank you so much for all your tweets and really yeah, hope you've enjoyed the this. Ones. Yeah, really hope you enjoyed the show. <laughs> um, so yeah, grand finale now. Uh, we've got Ukulele Society here and uh, they are going to play a science themed <coughs> Christmas song that you might just know. So <laughs> thanks for watching. <laughs> Take it away, Ukulele Society. On the first day of Christmas, my true love said to me, A tent joint on a new barn. On the second day of Christmas, my true love said to me, Two rays of light and a tent joint on a new barn. On the third day of Christmas, my true love said to me, Thank you. 